freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 404 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com auctions, auctions auctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is Rules for the Anti-Radicals, and our guest today is Paul Vallone. Paul is the president of Grassroots North Carolina, the executive director of Rights Watch International, host of Guns, Politics, and Freedom radio show, and the author of Rules for Anti-Radicals, a practical handbook for defeating leftism. Fantastic. Welcome to the show, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Absolutely. So uh, we had the pleasure of meeting you last year at the Gun Rights Policy Conference in, I believe it was in Texas last year. It's going to be in Phoenix this year in our area. So I hope that you'll be coming again. In all in all likelihood, yes, I will. As a matter of fact, I try to make the uh, GRPC every time I can. Oh, awesome. fantastic. And you had mentioned this book to me. I don't remember if it was actually published at the time. But I was so intrigued because, you know, the name of it kind of says a lot, right? It's a kind of a play on another book. Talk to us about that. You're exactly right. The title is a play on Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And if anybody recognizes Mr. Alinsky, uh, basically he has written the playbook for the left in hijacking America's media, cultural institutions, and schools for the past 50 years. Now, Alinsky might have been a reprehensible guy, after all, he dedicated his book to Lucifer. But having said that, what he had to say is not wrong. And so consequently, his 13 rules have been used to hijack American society. When Barack Obama called himself a community organizer, he was channeling Saul Alinsky. And so basically, this is my counterpoint to to Saul. Um, Matter of fact, the legislator who uh, kindly wrote the forward for the book for me says that I have refined Alinsky's tactics and turned them mercilessly against the left. I hope that's true because that was certainly my my objective. I just absolutely love it because so often it feels like our side, the side that understands the value of this incredible legacy that, that was handed down to us for free. We did we weren't the ones that fought, bled, starved, and died to secure our freedoms. It was given to us. It feels like we are too often spineless or just a little bit too eager to please. You know, we're kind of genuflecting all the time to the people who would trample on our rights. And then so to have a book like this, it feels like it it really is kind of that permission slip almost to <laughs> right to actually stop being a uh, jellyfish um <laughs> that's a good way to put it yep i basically i started out actually looking for a book of tactics to teach my own gun rights activists in my organization and uh, because i'm not getting any younger after all i figure people are going to have to carry on after me and try though i might i could not find a book of tactics I found books decrying Marxism, and I found a bunch of other stuff, but nothing that comprised the nuts and bolts, tactics, and the practical stuff to beat leftists in daily life. And so that's why I wrote the book. And it's, yes, it it is partially aimed at dedicated activists, but it's also aimed at mainstream Americans who, quite frankly, are tired of getting beaten down by the woke mob 
in their daily life. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, exactly. you, you can use this book for a variety of things. Uh, for example, I mean, school board uh, battles are very common now, given that the left is trying to indoctrinate our children. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, two of guys in my organization bought the book. They turned to the section on how to create a pol- political action committee. And then they created a pack and took out two sitting county commissioners. Awesome. Right, the stuff works. Yeah, it works. That is phenomenal. And, and I mean, this is a hefty book. There, you've got a lot of information in here. And uh, I have barely cracked the cover, but I always like to start with um, the, the table of con- contents. And I love chapter three, how leftists bludgeon you into submission. So, I mean, first you've got to, you've got to name the disease, right? You got to diagnose yep. what's wrong and then fix it. And, um, and I think that is so much it is that we're, we are so afraid of cancel culture. We're so afraid of being called whatever the latest ist is. And mm-hmm. so we just kind of duck and cover and try to live a quiet life. In, in the meantime, the other side, their megaphones are getting louder and louder and they're targeting uh, us younger and younger, as you said, school board meetings. <clears throat> So um, I'm I'm so glad to have this tool out there. Uh, without a doubt, I mean, um, and you are right. That, that is the culmination of 29 years of running gun rights organizations that you're looking at, and other other conservative organizations as well. But um, yes, um, part one of the book is aimed largely at teaching mainstream Americans how to avoid having a woke mob control them. You know, for example, there's a section in there on how to debate a leftist if you must. And that, by the way, is a steal from Ann Coulter. She wrote a book called How to Talk to a Liberal if You Must. I gave her credit for that. But in any case, um, typically uh, there are tricks that the left use. Uh, I had a debate, televised debate at one point, and not too far into the debate, one of the leftists looks at me and goes, you're a hater. Now, there are two ways you can answer that. And your typical, you know, value-oriented conservative would say, no, I'm not, for the following reasons. In which case, you have lost the debate because you you have allowed him to make the debate all about you. Okay? Instead, when he said that, I, I responded with, isn't that just like a leftist? You don't have a cogent argument, so you start slinging names. And now we've made it all about him. Mm-hmm. And that's one one little tactic that I use, you know, that, that that people can employ to avoid being pushed around. I love it. I might need to read this book. It might be good for some home use. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. I don't want to start a battle there now. I know. Have I just lost my last ar- or won my last argument? You know, we've we've been married 38 years and I, I can't remember the last time we had an argument. Well that's seriously. True. That's but true. it might come in handy. <laughs> In the future, I might want to do something. You never know. You never know. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I I just hate it how uh, you're you're labeled something every time you turn around. If you don't agree with somebody, then you are a something, and it's confusing yeah. because there's so many somethings you could be. Oh gosh, you know? I know. Mm-hmm. And some of them conflict with each other. So uh, you mentioned, you know, your you know, twenty plus years. I think you said of of running. Um, twenty nine. Rap- 29. Thank you for your service. I know that we reserve that generally for people that have served in the armed forces, but truly, I mean, that is a service um, to, to our nation. If you are building grassroots and we're not talking about this fake AstroTurf stuff, right. That's really funded by gajillionaires, right? right? Grassroots is people like you and me and Dan taking time out of our daily lives our family lives taking time off work putting our money and our time into things so i i do want to thank you for your service and so um how have you managed to use all of that in the state of north carolina to to make progress because north carolina it's it's pretty purplish right maybe leaning a little blue Yep. As a matter of fact, um, it is. And we recently even overrode one of the anti-gun Governor Roy Cooper's vetoes. But I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we do basically is we use 
grassroots mobilization techniques, and all of this is outlined in the book, um, to focus intense grassroots pressure on particular politicians or committees, or in some cases, corporations. The idea is, the, as the late Senator Everett Dirksen once put it, when they feel the heat, they see the light. And uh, again, the stuff works. Uh, in order to maintain ideological, uh, I, I guess, consistency, uh, my organization is all volunteer. Nobody takes dime for what they're doing. And frankly, if you remove the money trail, nothing scares a politician more than that. And so we basically live to put fear into the hearts of politicians. I taught a seminar last weekend and I told told people, I want you to pol think of politicians as rats. And no, I realize it's not much of a stretch, but rats in a Skinner box, and which is, you know, the, the principle of operant conditioning. Mm -hmm. If the rat goes down one arm of the Skinner box, it gets a food pellet. It goes down the other arm, it gets an electric shock. It quickly learns to go down the arm for the food pellet. Well, the behavioral incentives we apply aren't food pellets. They're the four things that a politician wants most. Votes, money, power, and public accolades. Mm -hmm. And so we have made science out of being able to deliver or withhold those things. And consequently, the politicians in North Carolina have responded by passing concealed carry, concealed handgun reciprocity, um, uh, statewide firearms preemption, range protection, castle doctrine, stand your ground. Uh, most recently, we passed Senate Bill 41 just earlier this year. Senate Bill 41 repealed our 1919 Jim Crow era pistol purchase permit law that some sheriffs were using to obstruct handgun buying. And it also expanded concealed carry into churches, which sponsored schools. Previously, it was uh, legal to carry in a church unless the church had a school, in which case it was educational property and carrying a firearm was a class H felony. Mm -hmm. We not only passed that, but of course, Roy Cooper vote, vetoed it. And we actually managed to override his veto with a six tenths majority in both chambers. The first time that has been done in eight years for one of his vetoes, the first time for a gun bill in North Carolina ever. Wow. wow. Congratulations. So here in Arizona, we, uh, we have a new governor, Governor Katie Hobbs, Democrat, and every single yeah. thing that we've worked on, um, the vice president of the AZCDL, the president of the AZCDL Foundation, um, and every bill that we've put forward and, and it's passed through the House and the Senate, she's just got this conveyor belt across her desk, I think, with her little veto stamp. Yeah. And I mean, she vetoed even basically stop, drop, and roll but for firearm safety as like who vetoes stop drop and roll you know and so mm -hmm. to try to use that uh veto override there there was a bill had nothing to do with guns obviously because the democrats they see the word gun or whoever sponsored it and they automatically run in the other direction which is so crazy because it's yeah. not a political the second amendment is not political it, it shouldn't be um, but it was a bill about, they call it the tamale bill. So people cooking in their homes, you know, very small micro businesses. Um, they, they, it got passed. Governor vetoed it. We thought, we had, right. We thought we had an override and then politics. One so, person backed off. And so it for you to get a gun thing overridden, that's that's amazing. I I want to. There's a lot that goes that. into the background behind it. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, for starters, it required us winning the 2022 elections, and we won. All right, mm -hmm. and we won because we grassroots organizations often fall short. They do good legislative work, but they don't have a pack, and you need a pack, and you need to do, and the pack needs to not just throw money at a few politicians and call it a day. The PAC needs to do independent expenditures for or against candidates. And so in the last election, we put out 150,000 voter guides covering every candidate for state and federal office across North Carolina. We mailed 120,000 of those directly to gun owning voters. The rest went out through civic organizations, gun shops, and gun shows. 
Then we mailed uh, about 75,000 postcard election alerts into selected districts, focus districts, we call them. Uh, we did about 20,000 robocalls. Uh, we did 70,000 peer-to-peer text messages. And then for the, I guess, the PS de resistance, we were pushing Ted Budd for United States Senate. And we put, uh, we used a new technology called geofencing to mm-hmm. deliver pro Ted Budd impressions to mobile devices. We delivered 1.7 million of those wow. impressions. Wow. So as a net result, we won a super majority, a veto proof super majority in the Senate. We were one seat shy of a super majority in the House, which as it turned out, worked out for us. And then we also won the majority, uh, conservative majority on the North Carolina Supreme Court, which is now seeing a benefit because they finally, five years after we passed it by ballot initiative, we finally got our voter ID law. So election operations, that's the key. That is the key. That is just fantastic. And I'm feeling like there's so much that Arizona could uh, learn from from watching what you've done there in North Carolina. So when you talk about a PAC, this is something that I, I've wondered in the last couple of elections. You'll see this PAC and that PAC and nine other PACs, and it looks like they're all doing the same work. They're all focusing on either this person's good or that person's bad. Doesn't it dilute the field to have a, a bunch of different PACs? shouldn't we consolidate how do you feel about that no i I don't i don't think that would be the case at all for starters if you are running a conventional pack and if you are making donations to candidates there are donation limits that'll be stipulated by your state or by the fec depending on whether the pack is a state or federal pack we have two packs ourselves the grnc political victory fund is a conventional federal pack and then we have a super pack which is the judicial fairness project the advantage of the super PAC is that donations are not to the PAC are not limited. Okay. They are unlimited. And we have some fairly wealthy donors that have donated a lot of money to that PAC. Uh, however, the downside or the, the drawback, if you will, you cannot coordinate between a super PAC and a candidate who benefits. There can be no coordination of the campaign whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Where the conventional PAC, I could, for example, do a mailing for this guy, or I could uh, call for volunteers for this guy, and it would be considered an in-kind contribution to the politician. Mm -hmm. But once again, I very, very rarely throw money at politicians. Mm -hmm. Only the the ones I do are the guys that are embattled by their own party because they are considered to be too conservative for the rhino centrist leadership. Mm -hmm. So. Gotcha. (laughs) Okay. Well, that is, I, I, always wanted to know that like why are we fighting against each other as packs but but i i understand the power of that so i guess the i would i would add that that the effect is cumulative okay Mm -hmm. if you see three or four different entities advocating one candidate people start to listen more yeah no that makes perfect sense you know it's kind of the same thing um you know with i think pro-gun groups so you know i there are there is sibling rivalry out there there are groups that um will act like they're competing with each other and i think that with just a tiny mindset shift as long as you are your values are the same right like if you have a no compromise group you don't want to partner with somebody that's about you know well maybe we can give or take on here but um I think it's better to have multiple voices, you know, the, the women's gun groups, you know, there's, there's not that many, but I think that we could use more. I'm part of the DC project. There are other groups out there that I think the more voices with the more banner heads, the better. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Actually, I would agree. And, you know, we have at points formed coalitions with other organizations uh, for federal legislation, like the, uh, attempted passing uh, universal background checks back in 2013. We created a a coalition of 39 uh, organizations all dedicated to the premise that we would not compromise on that bill. That said, however, you have to be very careful about what the other organizations, what their operating philosophy is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. For example, if they are hiring access based lobbyists, then more more likely than not, they are going to be excessively conciliatory and they will have to compromise because access based lobbyists make their living by access to politicians. Therefore, the politician controls the relationship. When we do grassroots mobilization, by contrast, I am telling the politician what the people want. And accordingly, I am the one who controls the relationship or, or any grassroots mobilization activist is the one who controls the relationship because what you're telling him is what he must do in order to remain in office. And if not, you will take him out. Gotcha. I, I had not even heard that phrase before, access base, but it makes perfect sense. Were you trying yeah. to get a word in edgewise? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I want to sit here and learn. Very good. I, I just thought I was stepping on your question. So, you know, when we talk about other organizations coming along beside, whether they're helping, whether they're, um, you know, sometimes you'll see an organization come in and take credit for the hard work that, that another organization has done. I think we all play pretty nice with one another about, you know, letting that slide because a win is a win, right? But um, you had something happen in North Carolina recently that um, it, it wasn't great to have help from another organization. Can you talk about that there, a little bit? Yeah, there really wasn't any help. There was only stealing credit. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, well, we had uh, House Bill 189 for permitless concealed carry. All right. Now, it stemmed from a bill back in 2017. The language is essentially similar. And it wasn't a pure, it's still alive, actually. It isn't a pure con constitutional carry bill. I would call it permitless concealed carry. And matter of fact, we call it freedom, freedom to carry North Carolina. Mm. And uh, we had gotten this bill through both the House Judiciary Committee and through the Rules Committee, and it was calendared for a floor vote that day uh, to get it passed uh, before the crossover deadline by which a bill must pass at least one chamber in order to remain alive. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, the NRA, which has been a part of none of these bills, that has not participated in the construction of the language at all, um, they showed up in the office of the bill sponsor on the day we had our committee meetings scheduled and the day before um, it was scheduled to go to the floor and complained about a very modest nominal training provision that the Speaker of the House had required be added in order to move the bill. And ultimately, they wound up opposing the bill. Uh -huh. And then without the cover of the NRA, I guess, um, the NRA is not what it once was, but unfortunately, it's still considered to be sort of the gold standard of, uh, of, of gun rights organizations, whether true or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyways, the speaker sent the bill back to the Rules Committee, and now we're going to have to add an appropriation or a fiscal note in order to keep the bill alive. The speaker mm -hmm. has hit, indicated his willingness to do that, so the bill is certainly not dead, but it will be a much harder road from this point forward. No. So the, the NRA, the, interestingly, the lobbyist, DJ Spiker, came out and said, well, we'll never compromise anything as, as serious as constitutional carry. That's nonsense. They've, con they've compromised not only on constitutional carry, but virtually every concept they've ever lobbied for in the existence of the organization. So um, I think most of the people who keep track of the NRA would call this their not invented here syndrome. If they didn't start it, if they can't claim credit for it, then they kill it. Paul, we've been compromising since 1968. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, heavy compromise. Think about, think about it. How much we have lost since the 1968 gun control bill. So well, I, I agree completely. That's why, you know, um, I teach people in my seminars compromise as our opposition defines it is a process under which you might lose less than under their original proposal but you still lose we don't right. gain anything and so right. that's why our like you guys our our uh, operating philosophy is we do not compromise on principle mm -hmm. okay um either the bill is going to mm -hmm. die or if, I, if i'm trying to kill a gun control bill uh or or not but i'm not going to take you know half of the gun control bill and I'm you, not look gonna the, you look at our constitution, you look at our, our, our Second Amendment, 
It has been compromised so many times. There is so many things. There's 27 words, and we have compromised so much. And our rights are being infringed as we speak. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I think it was uh, Ayn Rand said something to the effect of in any compromise between food and poison, only death can win. <laughs> right. That's, <laughs> that's, that's well so true. Well said. Well said. Um, so in your book, you do say that uh, our side, conservatives, are generally not prepared for politics. Now, am I saying that right? Not prepared for this battle, not prepared for, like, is it for politics that we're not prepared for and why? Uh, that's correct. And you, you phrased it exactly right. The reason conservatives are not prepared for political action is that by and large, we are honest people with honest motives. And so we tend to assume others in the process are honest or relatively uh. honest, or if not honest, at least responsive to um, rational incentives. Unfortunately, that concept is wrong. That entire notion is wrong. And that's why I tell people when we do political action, uh, all I really want from a politician is I want to extract his compliance. My goal is to impose my will on the politician or the committee or the corporation. And consequently, I do that using the behavioral incentives that I've just described. And once again, the stuff works when, you know, uh, it, it's it's one of my concepts that uh, unless you can deliver in the election pain in the election season for transgressions committed in the legislative season, then they will not do your bidding. And unless you are politically feared, you will never be politically respected. So. Mm -hmm. Boy, and isn't that just a sad thing? Because it does feel so often like our strengths are weaknesses in certain arenas. And our strengths of, you know, honesty and, you know, uh, trusting in others and that, just as you mm -hmm. said, it's it's a sad thing. And so uh, kind of leans me into my next question is, you know, your your book, it it is definitely written for the political conversation, the political battle at play. Mm -hmm. But is it useful for other things or do you really need to be either an activist or an advocate for it to be super practical for your life? Now, that's an excellent question. Basically, the book is divided into three parts. The first part is for Joe Mainstream American to keep mm. the woke mob from controlling him in daily, daily life. It could be used in neighborhood conversations, in informal converse debates with, with the left, uh, or it could be used in school boards, okay, because we now have a lot of uh, uh, battles going on as the left tries to indoctrinate our children, could be used in HOAs. Uh, I guess it's no coincidence that in my neighborhood, I'm the president of the HOA, okay? So uh, as I said, two guys bought the book and using it like an idiot's guide because it's not necessarily designed in such a way you have to read the entire thing. You can say, gee, I want to hold a demonstration, open it to page 54, and there is the checklist on, on, hold a, on how to hold a demonstration. Um, but <clears throat> so, no, it's, it's very useful for people in their daily lives as well as people who want to become dedicated activists. Now, the tail end of the book, that's for people who decided that they want to go into grassroots leadership. And that tells them how to form PACs, nonprofit organizations, not-for-profit organizations, uh, how to do fundraising, how to do communications uh, for uh, for uh, political uh, entities and, and whatnot. So. Very cool. Uh, I need to dive into this forthwith for all the reasons. I'm not, uh, our daughter is grown now, but we have two young grandchildren. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we have to be tapped into like the school board conversations, what the heck is going on there? I'm clearly yeah. involved in grassroots efforts. Um, so that will be very helpful. And I do wonder, you know, we use the word activist, but I consider myself more of an advocate. Do you make a distinction in your mind between those two words the way that I do? Or is that just my own proclivity? No, I, I, I can see a distinction between the two. I generally tell people they should be activists in their daily life by trying to control their environment around them. 
but without a doubt that involves i guess the, the sub part of that would be advocating for a particular position or a particular philosophy so yeah i think both both phrases are are appropriate very cool appreciate that um mm-hmm. I guess we're we're about down to the the end of my questions that I have time for today. But trust me when I say we have got to have more conversations like this. If you would come back, we'd love to love dig you. in deeper. Thank and by you. the way, they can they can find the book on my website at rulesforantiradicals.com. Rulesforantiradicals.com. And I've actually, in addition to the book, I've got some virtual seminars there, winning against woke projecting power in politics, a few a few seminars, and also a blog that I call the Anti-Radical. They can also get the book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or just about any place else, but rulesforantiradicals.com. Fantastic. And do you do seminars in person ever, or is it better? Do you, where do you do I, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I've got one scheduled that uh, coming up for the local GOP that I'm doing a seminar for them. Uh, I've been doing seminars at... Um, uh, conferences for quite some time now. Yes. I want to take one of those. I'm going to hunt that down. Is that on your website as well? Uh, it, there is a, the, yes, there is a consulting section there that I can, that, uh, to get a hold of me to, to retain me for any of that sort of thing. Basically we need to spread this knowledge. I need people to get the word out. I need them practicing this stuff. That is the only way we are going to take back America. Amen. Yes. Absolutely. Well, you were awfully quiet. I learned a lot. All right. That's sometimes it's more wise to be quiet. This is true. That's one of the chapters, I think, right? No, yeah. Maybe not. You listen and learn. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. We so appreciate you. And if I don't talk to you before, I will see you at the Gun Rights Policy Conference in Phoenix this year. Thank Thanks, you, Paul. Thank, Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So... A lot of this stuff is things I have to think in. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know how to comment on a lot of it. I, I definitely want to glance over the book and see what, what it has to offer. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Well, the fact that it's not just for guns, it's not just for election laws, it's not just for, you know, protecting our schools um, against woke, crazy ideologies. Um that just makes it such a useful tool for so many people, conversation starters. Um, Who would have thought that we would have had to be active with our school boards? I guess somebody did because guess who is active there? Yes. Right? Yeah. And um, anyway, I just love that, that Paul has taken the rules for radicals and thrown the anti on there that's that's fantastic all right well thank you to our amazing and knowledgeable guest f paul valone get your own copy of this read it it will it will change things it will change how you look at your environment how you talk to people in your environment um even casual conversations you you have in a a uber ride or something our side is so dumbed down and we are so fearful of of offending that we don't even speak our own truth to steal another phrase from the other side right having this kind of knowledge floating around actively in our minds will make us more bold um, and, and that can only be a good thing to have a good, strong counter argument to what is clearly a strong, uh, mainstream argument right now. We need that to find that middle space that, that all the best work is always done. Right. All right. Thank you again to F Paul Valone. Thank you to all of our amazing listeners all over the planet, wherever there is internet, we have people tuning in whether it's video or audio only because they are hungry for freedom for freedom right for what our subject matter experts are offering in these conversations and what a blessing to us that we get to have these conversations and present them to to the world so thank you so much for your time your time is your most finite and valuable commodity and when you spend it with us that's everything
if you want to go back and watch this interview over again, or if you want to watch any of the interviews we've done, go to uh, YouTube, go to GunStreamer, go to uh, any of the platforms that offer video-based service, and um, be sure you subscribe and click the notifications, all of the options offered on each site, because that tells that site that you are hungry for this kind of information. It makes it much harder for us to be silenced, squelched, and canceled. Um, and we really appreciate that. If you are out for a Sunday drive and you just want to listen to the audio only version, go to our webpage, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the on demand tab and binge listen to your heart's content, darling. <laughs> like a song just gets stuck in your head, doesn't it? Um, and if you want to go, if you want to uh, look at video, I'm sorry, uh, photos and bios, and links to all of the works of all of our guests, go to the guest tab on that website. There's it a is couple a, in there. Oh my goodness. It is a huge and ever-growing resource. Hundreds, hundreds. Maybe, maybe more. We have been so blessed to, to meet and know all of these amazing people out there doing good work uh, for their community, for their nation. Uh, and, um, you know, when you spend time there, we don't hate that, no. right? All right. Until next time, we are going to pray, pray for our nation. We are. We so need to. Oh, we do. This poor nation, which is so far off the mark right which now. Which is because of our politicians that we need to pray that they get the knowledge to understand that they are representatives and not leaders. Yeah, absolutely. That we can pray for that. Absolutely. But there's got to be a few representatives, leaders elected officials out there that you don't really like do we pray for them too? we even pray that nancy pelosi gets ice cream <laughs> cute expensive ice cream cute is she still now that she's not in office is she able to afford that ice cream oh she's she, i think she's she pretty well off. she's got a lot of money she got a lot of money which you know in her minimal wage yeah job that she had anyway we pray for the, her okay. get ice cream yep pray for them too all right, until next time, be good to each other. Have a great week and God bless. Bye-bye.